Chapter Fourteen of The Story of the Amulet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbit. Chapter Fourteen: The Heart's Desire. If I only had time, I could tell you lots of things. For instance, how, in spite of the advice of the Samiad, the four children did one very wet day go through their amulet arch into the golden desert and there find the great temple of baalbek and meet with the phoenix whom they never thought to see again and how the phoenix did not remember them at all until it went into a sort of prophetic trance if that can be called remembering but alas i haven't time so i must leave all that out though it was a wonderfully thrilling adventure i must leave out too all about the visit of the children to the hippodrome with the samiad in its travelling bag and about how the wishes of the people round about them were granted so suddenly and surprisingly that at last the samiad had to be taken hurriedly home by anthea who consequently missed half the performance then there was the time when nurse having gone to tea with a friend out iverlunk way they were playing devil in the dark and in the midst of that most creepy pastime the postman's knock frightened jane nearly out of her life she took in the letters however and put them in the back of the hat-stand drawer so that they should be safe and safe they were for she never thought of them again for weeks and weeks one really good thing happened when they took the samiad to a magic lantern show and lecture at the boys school at camden town the lecture was all about our soldiers in south africa and the lecturer ended up by saying and i hope every boy in this room has in his heart the seeds of courage and heroism and self-sacrifice and i wish that every one of you may grow up to be noble and brave and unselfish worthy citizens of this great empire for whom our soldiers have freely given their lives and of course this came true which was a distinct score for camden town as anthea said it was unlucky that the lecturer said boys because now she and jane would have to be noble and unselfish if at all without any outside help but jane said i dare say we are all ready because of our beautiful natures it's only boys that have to be made brave by magic which nearly led to a first-class row and i dare say you would like to know all about the affair of the fishing-rod and the fish-hooks and the cook next door which was amusing from some points of view though not perhaps the cook's but there really is no time even for that the only thing that there's time to tell about is the adventure of masculine and cooks and the unexpected apparition which is also the beginning of the end it was nurse who broke into the gloomy music of the autumn rain on the window panes by suggesting a visit to the egyptian hall england's home of mystery though they had good but private reasons to know that their own particular personal mystery was of a very different brand the four all brightened at the idea all children as well as a good many grown-ups love conjuring it's in piccadilly said old nurse carefully counting out the proper number of shillings into cyril's hand not so very far down on the left from the circus there's big pillars outside something like carter's seed place in holborn as used to be day and martin's blacking when i was a gal and something like euston station only not so big yes i know said everybody so they started but though they walked along the left-hand side of piccadilly they saw no pillared building that was at all like carter's seed warehouse or euston station or England's home of mystery, as they remembered it. At last they stopped a hurried lady, and asked her the way to Masculine and Cook's. "'I don't know, I'm sure,' she said, pushing past them. "'I always shop at the stores.' Which just shows, as Jane said, how ignorant grown-up people are. It was a policeman who at last explained to them that England's mysteries are now, appropriately enough, enacted at st george's hall so they tramped to langham place and missed the first two items in the programme but they were in time for the most wonderful magic appearances and disappearances which they could hardly believe even with all their knowledge of a larger magic was not really magic after all 
If only the Babylonians could have seen this conjuring, whispered Cyril. It takes the shine out of their old conjurer, doesn't it? Hush, said Anthea, and several other members of the audience. Now, there was a vacant seat next to Robert, and it was when all eyes were fixed on the stage where Mr. Devant was pouring out glasses of all sorts of different things to drink, out of one kettle with one spout, and the audience were delightedly tasting them, that Robert felt someone in that vacant seat. He did not feel someone sit down in it. It was just that one moment there was no one sitting there, and the next moment, suddenly, there was someone. Robert turned. The someone who had suddenly filled that empty place was Rech Mara, the priest of Amen. Though the eyes of the audience were fixed on Mr. David Devant, Mr. David Devant's eyes were fixed on the audience, and it happened that his eyes were more particularly fixed on that empty chair, so that he saw quite plainly the sudden appearance, from nowhere, of the Egyptian priest. A jolly good trick, he said to himself, and worked under my own eyes, in my own hall. I'll find out how that's done. He had never seen a trick that he could not do himself if he tried. By this time, a good many eyes in the audience had turned on the clean-shaven, curiously dressed figure of the Egyptian priest. Ladies and gentlemen, said Mr. Devant, rising to the occasion, this is a trick I have never before performed. The empty seat, third from the end, second row, gallery, you will now find occupied by an ancient Egyptian, warranted genuine. He little knew how true his words were, and now all eyes were turned on the priest and the children, and the whole audience, after a moment's breathless surprise, shouted applause. Only the lady on the other side of Rechmara drew back a little. She knew no one had passed her, and, as she said later, over tea and cold tongue, It was that sudden it made her flesh creep. Rechmara seemed very much annoyed at the notice he was exciting. Come out of this crowd, he whispered to Robert. I must talk with you apart. Oh, no, Jane whispered. I did so want to see the mascot moth and the ventriloquist. How did you get here? was Robert's return whisper. How did you get to Egypt and to Tyre? retorted Rechmara. Come. Let us leave this crowd. There's no help for it, I suppose. Robert shrugged angrily, but they all got up. Confederates, said a man in the row behind. Now they go round to the back and take part in the next scene. I wish we did, said Robert. Confederate yourself, said Cyril, and so they got away, the audience applauding to the last. In the vestibule of St. George's Hall they disguised Rachmara as well as they could, but even with Robert's hat and Cyril's Inverness cape he was too striking a figure for foot exercise in the London streets. It had to be a cab, and it took the last least money of all of them. They stopped the cab a few doors from home, and then the girls went in and engaged old nurse's attention by an account of the conjuring and a fervent entreaty for dripping toast with their tea, leaving the front door open so that while nurse was talking to them, the boys could creep quietly in with Rechmara and smuggle him, unseen, up the stairs into their bedroom. When the girls came up, they found the Egyptian priest sitting on the side of Cyril's bed, his hands on his knees, looking like a statue of a king. Come on, said Cyril impatiently. He won't begin till we're all here. And shut the door, can't you? When the door was shut, the Egyptian said, My interests and yours are one. Very interesting, said Cyril. And it'll be a jolly sight more interesting if you keep following us about in a decent country with no more clothes on than that. Peace, said the priest. What is this country? And what is this time? The country's England, said Anthea. And the time's about six thousand years later than your time. The amulet, then, said the priest, deeply thoughtful, gives the power to move to and fro in time. 
as well as in space. That's about it, said Cyril gruffly. Look here, it'll be tea time directly. What are we to do with you? You have one half of the amulet, I the other, said Rechmara. All that is now needed is the pin to join them. Don't you think it, said Robert. The half you've got is the same half as the one we've got. But the same thing cannot be in the same place and the same time, and yet be not one but twain, said the priest. See, here is my half. He laid it on the Marcella counterpane. Where is yours? Jane, watching the eyes of the others, unfastened the string of the amulet and laid it on the bed but too far off for the priest to seize it, even if he had been so dishonourable. Cyril and Robert stood beside him, ready to spring on him, if one of his hands had moved but ever so little towards the magic treasure that was theirs. But his hands did not move, only his eyes opened very wide, and so did every one else's, for the amulet the priest had now quivered and shook, and then, as steel is drawn to the magnet, it was drawn across the white counterpane, nearer and nearer to the amulet warm from the neck of Jane, and then, as one drop of water mingles with another on a rain-wrinkled window-pane, as one bead of quicksilver is drawn into another bead, Rechmara's amulet slipped into the other one, and behold, there was no more but the one amulet. "'Black magic!' cried Rechmara and sprang forward to snatch the amulet that had swallowed his. But Anthea caught it up, and at the same moment the priest was jerked back by a rope thrown over his head. It drew, tightened with the pull of his forward leap, and bound his elbows to his sides. Before he had time to use his strength to free himself, Robert had knotted the cord behind him, and tied it to the bedpost. Then the four children, overcoming the priest's wriggling and kickings, tied his legs with more rope. "'I thought—' said Robert, breathing hard, and drawing the last knot tight. He'd have a try for hours, so I got the ropes out of the box-room, so as to be ready. The girls, with rather white faces, applauded his foresight. "'Loosen these bonds!' cried Rechmara in fury. "'Before I blast you with the seven secret curses!' of amen ra we shouldn't be likely to lose them after robert retorted oh don't quarrel said anthea desperately look here he has just as much right to the thing as we have this she took up the amulet that had swallowed the other one this has got his in it as well as being ours let's go shares let me go cried the priest writhing now look here, said Robert. If you make a row, we can just open that window and call the police, the guards, you know, and tell them you've been trying to rob us. Now will you shut up and listen to reason? I suppose so, said Rechmara sulkily. But reason could not be spoken to him till a whispered council had been held in the far corner by the wash-hand stand and the towel-horse a council rather long and very earnest. At last Anthea detached herself from the group, and went back to the priest. "'Look here,' she said in her kind little voice. "'We want to be friends. We want to help you. Let's make a treaty. Let's join together to get the amulet, the whole one, I mean, and then it shall belong to you as much as to us, and we shall all get our heart's desire.' "'Fair words,' said the priest. Grow no onions. We say butter no parsnips, Jane put in. But don't you see we want to be fair? Only we want to bind you in the chains of honour and upright dealing. Will you deal fairly by us? said Robert. I will, said the priest. By the sacred secret name that is written under the altar of Amen Ra. I will deal fairly by you. Will you, too, take the oath of honourable partnership? No, said Anthea on the instant, and added rather rashly, We don't swear in England, 
except in police courts, where the guards are, you know, and you don't want to go there. But when we say we'll do a thing, it's the same as an oath to us. We do it. You trust us, and we'll trust you. She began to unbind his legs, and the boys hastened to untie his arms. When he was free, he stood up, stretched his arms, and laughed. Ha, 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 ha. Now, he said, I am stronger than you, and my oath is void. I have sworn by nothing, and my oath is nothing likewise. For there is no secret sacred name under the altar of Amen Ra. Oh, yes, there is, said a voice from under the bed. Everyone started, Rech Mara most of all. Cyril stooped and pulled out the bath of sand where the Samyad slept. You don't know everything, though you are a divine father of the Temple of Amen, said the Samyad, shaking itself till the sand fell tinkling on the bath edge. There is a secret, sacred name beneath the altar of Amen Ra. Shall I call on that name? No. No, cried the priest in terror. No, said Jane, too. Don't let's have any calling names. Besides, said Rechmara, who had turned very white indeed under his natural brownness. I was only going to say that though there isn't any name under... There is, said the Samiad threateningly. Well, even if there wasn't... I will be bound by the wordless oath of your strangely upright land. And, having said that I will be your friend, I will be it. Then that's all right, said the Samiad. And there's the tea bell. What are you going to do with your distinguished partner? He can't go down to tea like that, you know. You see, we can't do anything till the 3rd of December, said Anthea. That's when we are to find the whole charm. What can we do with Rekmara till then? Box room, said Cyril briefly. And smuggle up his meals. It will be rather fun. Like a fleeing cavalier concealed from exasperated roundheads, said Robert. Yes. So Rekmara was taken up to the box room and made as comfortable as possible in a snug nook between an old nursery fender and the wreck of a big four-poster. They gave him a big rag-bag to sit on, and an old moth-eaten fur coat off the nail on the door to keep him warm, and when they had had their own tea, they took him some. He did not like the tea at all, but he liked the bread and butter and cake that went with it. They took it in turns to sit with him during the evening, and left him fairly happy and quite settled for the night. But when they went up in the morning with a kipper, a quarter of which each of them had gone without at breakfast, Rechmara was gone. There was the cosy corner with the rag-bag and the moth-eaten fur coat, but the cosy corner was empty. Good riddance! was naturally the first delightful thought in each mind. The second was less pleasing, because everyone at once remembered that since his amulet had been swallowed up by theirs, which hung once more round the neck of Jane, he could have no possible means of returning to his Egyptian past. Therefore he must be still in England, and probably somewhere quite near them, plotting mischief. The attic was searched, to prevent mistakes, but quite vainly. The best thing we can do, said Cyril, is to go through the half amulet straight away, get the whole amulet, and come back. I don't know, Anthea hesitated. Would that be quite fair? Perhaps he isn't really a base deceiver. Perhaps something's happened to him. Happened? said Cyril. Not it. Besides, what could happen? I don't know, said Anthea. Perhaps burglars came in the night and accidentally killed him and took away all the... all that was mortal of him, you know, to avoid discovery. Or perhaps, said Cyril, they hid the... All that was mortal in one of those big trunks in the box room. Shall we go back and look? He added grimly. No, no. Jane shuddered. Let's go and tell the Samiad and see what it says. No, said Anthea. 
let's ask the learned gentleman if anything has happened to wreck mara a gentleman's advice would be more useful than a samiet's and the learned gentleman will only think it's a dream like he always does they tapped at the door and on the come in entered the learned gentleman was sitting in front of his untasted breakfast opposite him in the easy chair sat rech mara hush said the learned gentleman very earnestly please hush or the dream will go i am learning oh what have i not learned in the last hour in the grey dawn said the priest i left my hiding-place and finding myself among these treasures from my own country i remained i feel more at home here somehow of course i know it's a dream said the learned gentleman feverishly but oh ye gods what a dream by jove call not upon the gods said the priest lest ye raise greater ones than ye can control already he explained to the children he and i are as brothers and his welfare is dear to me as my own he has told me the learned gentleman began but robert interrupted this was no moment for manners have you told him he asked the priest all about the amulet no said rechmara then tell him now he is very learned perhaps he can tell us what to do rechmara hesitated then told and oddly enough none of the children ever could remember afterwards what it was that he did tell perhaps he used some magic to prevent their remembering when he had done the learned gentleman was silent leaning his elbow on the table and his head on his hand dear jimmy said anthea gently don't worry about it we are sure to find it to-day somehow yes said rechmara and perhaps with it death it's to bring us our heart's desire said robert who knows said the priest what things undreamed of and infinitely desirable lie beyond the dark gates oh don't said jane almost whimpering the learned gentleman raised his head suddenly why not he suggested go back into the past at a moment when the amulet is unwatched wish to be with it and that it shall be under your hand it was the simplest thing in the world and yet none of them had ever thought of it come cried rechmara leaping up come now may may i come the learned gentleman timidly asked it's only a dream you know come and welcome o oh brother rechmara was beginning but cyril and robert with one voice cried no you weren't with us in atlantis robert added or you'd know better than to let him come dear jimmy said anthea please don't ask to come we'll go and be back again before you have time to know that we're gone and he too we must keep together said rechmara since there is but one perfect amulet to which i and these children have equal claims jane held up the amulet rechmara went first and they all passed through the great arch into which the amulet grew at the name of power the learned gentleman saw through the arch a darkness lighted by smoky gleams he rubbed his eyes and he only rubbed them for ten seconds the children and the priest were in a small dark chamber a square doorway of massive stone let in gleams of shifting light and the sound of many voices chanting a slow strange hymn they stood listening now and then the chant quickened and the light grew brighter as though fuel had been thrown on a fire where are we whispered anthea and when whispered robert this is some shrine near the beginnings of belief said the egyptian shivering take the amulet and come away it is cold here in the morning of the world 
and then jane felt that her hand was on a slab or table of stone and under her hand something that felt like the charm that had so long hung round her neck only it was thicker twice as thick it's here she said i've got it and she hardly knew the sound of her own voice come away repeated rechemara i wish we could see more of this temple said robert resistingly come away the priest urged there is death all about and strong magic listen the chanting voices seemed to have grown louder and fiercer and light stronger they are coming cried rechmara quick quick the amulet jane held it up what a long time you've been rubbing your eyes said anthea don't you see we've got back the learned gentleman merely stared at her miss anthea miss jane it was nurse's voice very much higher and squeaky and more excited than usual oh bother said everyone cyril adding you just go on with the dream for a sec mr jimmy we'll be back directly nurse'll come up if we don't she wouldn't think rachmara was a dream then they went down nurse was in the hall an orange envelope in one hand and a pink paper in the other your pa and ma's come home reach london eleven fifteen prepare rooms as directed in letter and signed in their two names oh, oh hooray, 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 hooray 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 shouted the boys and jane but anthea could not shout she was nearer crying oh she said almost in a whisper then it was true and we have got our heart's desire but i don't understand about the letter nurse was saying i haven't had no letter oh said jane in a queer voice i wonder whether it was one of those they came that night you know when we were playing devil in the dark and i put them in the hat stand drawer behind the clothes brushes and she pulled out the drawer as she spoke and here they are there was a letter for nurse and one for the children the letters told how father had done being a war correspondent and was coming home and how mother and the lamb were going to meet him in italy and all come home together and how the lamb and mother were quite well and how a telegram would be sent to tell the day and the hour of their homecoming mercy me said old nurse i declare if it's not too bad of you miss jane i shall have a nice to do getting things straight for your pa and ma oh never mind nurse said jane hugging her isn't it just too lovely for anything we'll come and help you said cyril there's just something upstairs we've got to settle up and then we'll all come and help you get along with you said old nurse but she laughed jollily nice help you'd be i know you and it's ten o'clock now there was in fact something upstairs that they had to settle quite a considerable something too and it took much longer than they expected a hasty rush into the boys room secured the samiad very sandy and very cross it doesn't matter how cross and sandy it is though said anthea it ought to be there at the final council it'll give the learned gentleman fits i expect said robert when he sees it but it didn't the dream is growing more and more wonderful he exclaimed when the samiad had been explained to him by rechmara i have dreamed this beast before now said robert jane has got the half amulet and i've got the whole show up jane jane untied the string and laid her half amulet on the table littered with dusty papers and the clay cylinders marked all over with little marks like the little prints of birds little feet robert laid down the whole amulet and anthea gently restrained the eager hand of the learned gentleman as it reached out yearningly towards the perfect specimen and then just as before on the marcella quilt so now on the dusty litter of papers and curiosities the half amulet quivered and shook and then as steel is drawn to a magnet it was drawn across the dusty manuscripts nearer and nearer to the perfect amulet warm from the pocket of robert 
and then as one drop of water mingles with another when the panes of the window are wrinkled with rain as one bead of mercury is drawn into another bead the half amulet that was the children's and was also rechmara's slipped into the whole amulet and behold there was only one the perfect and ultimate charm and that's all right said the samiad breaking a breathless silence yes said anthea and we've got our heart's desire father and mother and the lamb are coming home to-day but what about me said rechmara what is your heart's desire anthea asked great and deep learning said the priest without a moment's hesitation a learning greater and deeper than that of any man of my land and my time but learning too great is useless if i go back to my own land and my own age who will believe my tales of what i have seen in the future let me stay here be the great knower of all that has been in our time so living to me so old to you about which your learned men speculate unceasingly and often he tells me vainly if i were you said the samiad i should ask the amulet about that it's a dangerous thing trying to live in a time that's not your own you can't breathe an air that's thousands of centuries ahead of your lungs without feeling the effects of it sooner or later prepare the mystic circle and consult the amulet oh what a dream cried the learned gentleman dear children if you love me and i think you do in dreams and out of them prepare the mystic circle and consult the amulet they did as once before when the sun had shone in august splendour they crouched in a circle on the floor now the air outside was thick and yellow with the fog that by some strange decree always attends the cattle show week and in the street costers were shouting er hekosetje jane said the name of power and instantly the light went out and all the sounds went out too so that there was a silence and a darkness both deeper than any darkness or silence that you have ever even dreamed of imagining it was like being deaf or blind only darker and quieter even than that then out of that vast darkness and silence came a light and a voice the light was too faint to see anything by and the voice was too small for you to hear what it said but the light and the voice grew and the light was the light that no man may look on and live and the voice was the sweetest and most terrible voice in the world the children cast down their eyes and so did every one i speak said the voice what is it that you would hear there was a pause every one was afraid to speak what are we to do about rechmara said robert suddenly and abruptly shall he go back through the amulet to his own time or no one can pass through the amulets now said the beautiful terrible voice to any land or any time only when it was imperfect could such things be but men may pass through the perfect charm to the perfect union which is not of time or space would you be so very kind said anthea tremulously as to speak so that we can understand you the Samiad said something about Rekmara not being able to live here, and if he can't get back— She stopped. Her heart was beating desperately in her throat, as it seemed. Nobody can continue to live in a land and in a time not appointed, said the voice of glorious sweetness. But a soul may live, if in that other time and land there be found a soul so akin to it as to offer it refuge in the body of that land and time that thus they too may be one soul in one body the children exchanged discouraged glances but the eyes of rechmara and the learned gentleman met and were kind to each other and promised each other many things secret and sacred and very beautiful anthea saw the look 
oh but she said without at all meaning to say it jimmy's dear soul isn't at all like Rekmara's. i'm sure it isn't i don't want to be rude but it isn't you know dear jimmy's soul is as good as gold and nothing that is not good can pass beneath the double arch of my perfect amulet said the voice if both are willing say the word of power and let the two souls become one for ever and evermore shall i asked jane yes yes the voices were those of the egyptian priest and the learned gentleman and the voices were eager alive thrilled with hope and the desire of great things so jane took the amulet from robert and held it up between the two men and said for the last time the word of power er hecka seche the perfect amulet grew into a double arch the two arches leaned to each other making a great a a stands for amen whispered jane what he was a priest of hush breathed anthea the great double arch glowed in and through the green light that had been there since the name of power had first been spoken it glowed with a light more bright yet more soft than the other light a glory and splendour and sweetness unspeakable come cried rechmara holding out his hands come cried the learned gentleman and he also held out his hands each moved forward under the glowing glorious arch of the perfect amulet then rechmara quavered and shook and as steel is drawn to a magnet he was drawn under the arch of magic nearer and nearer to the learned gentleman and as one drop of water mingles with another when the window-glass is rain-wrinkled as one quicksilver bead is drawn to another quicksilver bead rechmara divine father of the temple of amen ra was drawn into slipped into disappeared into and was one with jimmy the good the beloved the learned gentleman and suddenly it was good daylight and the december sun shone the fog had passed away like a dream the amulet was there little and complete in jane's hand and there were the other children and the samiad and the learned gentleman but rechmara or the body of rechmara was not there any more as for his soul ugh the horrid thing cried robert and put his foot on a centipede as long as your finger that crawled and wriggled and squirmed at the learned gentleman's feet that said the samiad was the evil in the soul of rechmara there was a deep silence then rechmara's him now said jane at last all that was good in rechmara said the samiad he ought to have his heart's desire too said anthea in a sort of stubborn gentleness his heart's desire said the samiad is the perfect amulet you hold in your hand yes and has been ever since he first saw the broken half of it we've got ours said anthea softly yes said the samiad its voice was crosser than they had ever heard it your parents are coming home and what's to become of me i shall be found out and made a show of and degraded in every possible way i know they'll make me go into parliament hateful place all mud and no sand that beautiful baalbek temple in the desert a plenty of good sand there and no politics i wish i were there safe in the past that i do i wish you were said the learned gentleman absently yet polite as ever the samiad swelled itself up turned its long snail's eyes in one last lingering look at anthea a loving look she always said and thought and vanished well said anthea after a silence i suppose it's happy the only thing it ever did really care for was sand my dear children said the learned gentleman i must have fallen asleep i've had the most extraordinary dream i hope it was a nice one said cyril with courtesy 
Yes, I feel a new man after it. Absolutely a new man. There was a ring at the front doorbell. The opening of a door. Voices. It's them, cried Robert, and a thrill ran through four hearts. Here, cried Anthea, snatching the amulet from Jane and pressing it into the hand of the learned gentleman. Here, it's yours, your very own, a present from us, because you're Rekmara as well as, I mean, because you're such a dear. She hugged him briefly but fervently, and the four swept down the stairs to the hall, where a cabman was bringing in boxes, and where, heavily disguised in travelling cloaks and wraps, was their heart's desire, threefold, mother, father, and the lamb. Bless me, said the learned gentleman, left alone. Bless me, what a treasure, the dear children. It must be their affection that has given me these luminous abacus. I seem to see so many things now, things I never saw before. The dear children, the dear, dear children. End of chapter 14 End of The Story of the Amulet by E. Nesbitt Chapter 13 of The Story of the Amulet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbitt Chapter 13 The Shipwreck on the Tin Islands Blue and red, said Jane softly, make purple. Not always they don't, said Cyril. It has to be crimson lake and Prussian blue. If you mix vermilion and indigo, you get the most loathsome slate color. Sepia is the nastiest color in the box, I think, said Jane, sucking her brush. They were all painting. Nurse, in the flush of grateful emotion, excited by Robert's border of poppies, had presented each of the four with a shilling paint box and had supplemented the gift with a pile of old copies of the illustrated london news sepia said cyril instructively is made out of beastly cuttlefish purple's made out of a fish as well as out of red and blue said robert tyrian purple was i know out of lobsters said jane dreamily they're red when they're boiled and blue when they aren't if you mix live and dead lobsters you'd get tyrian purple I shouldn't like to mix anything with a live lobster, said Anthea, shuddering. Well, there aren't any other red and blue fish, said Jane. You'd have to. I'd rather not have the purple, said Anthea. The Tyrian purple wasn't that color when it came out of the fish, nor yet afterwards it wasn't, said Robert. It was scarlet, really, and Roman emperors wore it. And it wasn't any nice color while the fish had it. It was a yellowish-white liquid of a creamy consistency. How do you know? asked Cyril. I read it, said Robert, with the meek pride of superior knowledge. Where? asked Cyril. In print, said Robert, still more proudly meek. You think everything's true if it's printed, said Cyril, naturally annoyed. But it isn't. Father said so. Quite a lot of lies get printed, especially in newspapers. You see, as it happens, said Robert, in what was really a rather annoying tone. It wasn't a newspaper, it was in a book. How sweet Chinese white is, said Jane, dreamily sucking her brush again. I don't believe it, said Cyril to Robert. Have a suck yourself, suggested Robert. I don't mean about the Chinese white, I mean about the cream fish turning purple and— Oh, cried Anthea, jumping up very quickly. I'm tired of painting. Let's go somewhere by amulet. I say, let's let it choose. Cyril and Robert agreed that this was an idea. Jane consented to stop painting, because, as she said, Chinese white, though certainly sweet, gives you a queer feeling in the back of the throat if you paint with it too long. The amulet was held up. Take us somewhere, said Jane. Anywhere you like in the past, but somewhere where you are. Then she said the word. Next moment, everyone felt a queer rocking and swaying, something like what you feel when you go out in a fishing boat. And that was not wonderful when you come to think of it, 
for it was in a boat that they found themselves a queer boat with high bulwarks pierced with holes for oars to go through there was a high seat for the steersman and the prow was shaped like the head of some great animal with big staring eyes the boat rode at anchor in a bay and the bay was very smooth the crew were dark wiry fellows with black beards and hair they had no clothes except a tunic from waist to knee and round caps with knobs on the top they were very busy and what they were doing was so interesting to the children that at first they did not even wonder where the amulet had brought them and the crew seemed too busy to notice the children they were fastening rush baskets to a long rope with a great piece of cork at the end and in each basket they put mussels or little frogs then they cast out the rope the baskets sank but the cork floated and all about on the blue water were other boats and all the crews of all the boats were busy with ropes and baskets and frogs and mussels whatever are you doing jane suddenly asked a man who had rather more clothes than the others and seemed to be a sort of captain or overseer he started and stared at her but he had seen too many strange lands to be very much surprised at these queerly dressed stowaways certain loins for the doy shellfish he said shortly how did you get here a sort of magic said robert carelessly the captain fingered an amulet that hung round his neck what is this place asked cyril tire of course said the man then he drew back and spoke in a low voice to one of the sailors now we shall know about your precious cream jug fish said cyril but we never said come to tire said jane the amulet heard us talking i expect i think it's most obliging of it said anthea and the amulet's here too said robert we ought to be able to find it in a little ship like this i wonder which of them's got it oh look look cried anthea suddenly on the bare breast of one of the sailors gleamed something red it was the exact counterpart of their precious half amulet a silence full of emotion was broken by jane then we found it she said oh do let's take it and go home easy to say take it said cyril he looks very strong he did yet not so strong as the other sailors it's odd said anthea musingly i do believe i've seen that man somewhere before he's rather like our learned gentleman said robert but i'll tell you who he's much more like at that moment that sailor looked up his eyes met robert's and robert and the others had no longer any doubt as to where they had seen him before it was rech mara the priest who had led them to the palace of pharaoh and whom jane had looked back at through the arch when he was counselling pharaoh's guard to take the jewels and fly for his life nobody was quite pleased and nobody quite knew why jane voiced the feelings of all when she said fingering their amulet through the folds of her frock we can go back in a minute if anything nasty happens for the moment nothing worse happened than an offer of food figs and cucumbers it was and very pleasant i see said the captain that you are from a far country since you have honoured my boat by appearing on it you must stay here till morning then i will lead you to one of our great ones he loves strangers from far lands let's go home jane whispered all the frogs are drowning now i think the people here are cruel but the boys wanted to stay and see the lines taken up in the morning it's just like eel pots and lobster pots said cyril the baskets only open from the outside i vote we stay so they stayed let's toyer over there said the captain who was evidently trying to be civil he pointed to a great island rock that rose steeply from the sea crowned with huge walls and towers there was another city on the mainland that's part of tyre too said the captain that's where the great merchants have their pleasure-houses and gardens and farms 
Look, look! Cyril cried suddenly. What a lovely little ship! A ship in full sail was passing swiftly through the fishing fleet. The captain's face changed. He frowned, and his eyes blazed with fury. Insolent young barbarian! he cried. Do ye call the ships of Tyre well? None greater sail the seas. That ship has been on a three years' voyage. She is known in all the great trading ports from here to the Tin Islands. She comes back rich and glorious. Her very anchor is of silver. I'm sure we beg your pardon, said Anthea hastily. In our country we say little for a pet name. Your wife might call you her dear little husband, you know. I should like to catch her at it, growled the captain, but he stopped scowling. It's a rich trade, he went on. Fur cloth once dipped, second best glass, on the rough images our young artists carve for practice. The barbarian king in Tessos lets us work the silver mines. We get so much silver there that we leave em our iron anchors and come back with silver ones. How splendid, said Robert. Do go on. What's cloth once dipped? Are oh, you must be barbarians from the outer darkness, said the captain scornfully. All wealthy nations know that our finest stuffs are twice dipped. Diepapfa. They're only for the robes of kings and priests and princes. What do the rich merchants wear? asked Jane with interest. In the pleasure houses. I wear the diebapther. Oh, merchants are princes, scowled the skipper. Oh, don't be cross. We do so like hearing about things. We want to know all about the dying, said Anthea cordially. Oh, you do, do you? growled the man. So that's what you're here for. Well, you won't get the secrets of the doy trade out of me. He went away and everyone felt snubbed and uncomfortable. And all the time the long, narrow eyes of the Egyptian were watching, watching. They felt as though he was watching them through the darkness when they lay down to sleep on a pile of cloaks. Next morning the baskets were drawn up, full of what looked like whelk shells. The children were rather in the way, but they made themselves as small as they could. While the skipper was at the other end of the boat, they did ask one question of a sailor whose face was a little less unkind than the others. Yes, he answered. This is the dive fish. It's a sort of murex, and there is another kind that they catch at Sidon, and then, of course, there is the kind that's used for the debapta. But that's quite different. It's a... Hold your tongue, shouted the skipper, and the man held it. The laden boat was rowed slowly round the end of the island, and was made fast in one of the two great harbours that lay inside a long breakwater. The harbour was full of all sorts of ships, so that Cyril and Robert enjoyed themselves much more than their sisters. The breakwater and the quays were heaped with bales and baskets, and crowded with slaves and sailors. Farther along, some men were practising diving. That's jolly good said Robert, as a naked brown body cleft the water. I should think so, said the skipper. The pearl divers of Persia are not more skilful. Why, we've got a freshwater spring that comes out of the bottom of the sea. Our divers dive down and bring up the fresh water in skin balls. Can your barbarians do as much? I suppose not, said Robert, and put away a wild desire to explain to the captain the English system of waterworks, pipes, taps, and the intricacies of the plumber's trade. As they neared the quay, the skipper made a hasty toilet. He did his hair, combed his beard, put on a garment like a jersey with short sleeves, an embroidered belt, a necklace of beads, and a big signet ring. Now, said he, I am fit to be seen. Come along. 
Where to? said Jane cautiously. The feller's the great sea captain, said the skipper. The man I told you of, who loves barbarians. Then Rechmara came forward, and for the first time spoke. I have known these children in another land, he said. You know my powers of magic. It was my magic that brought these barbarians to your boat. And you know how they will profit you. I read your thoughts. Let me come with you and see the end of them. And then I will work the spell I promised you in return for the little experience you have so kindly given me on your boat. The skipper looked at the Egyptian with some disfavor. So it was your doing, he said. I might have guessed it. Well, come on. So he came, and the girls wished he hadn't. But Robert whispered, Nonsense. As long as he's with us, we've got some chance of the amulet. We can always fly if anything goes wrong. The morning was so fresh and bright. Their breakfast had been so good and so unusual. They had actually seen the amulet round the Egyptian's neck. One or two or all of these things suddenly raised the children's spirits. They went off quite cheerfully through the city gate. It was not arched, but roofed over with a great flat stone, and so through the street, which smelt horribly of fish and garlic and a thousand other things even less agreeable. But far worse than the street scents was the scent of the factory where the skipper called in to sell his night's catch. I wish I could tell you all about that factory, but I haven't time, and perhaps, after all, you aren't interested in dying works. I will only mention that Robert was triumphantly proved to be right. The dye was a yellowish-white liquid of a creamy consistency, and it smelt more strongly of garlic than garlic itself does. While the skipper was bargaining with the master of the dye works, the Egyptian came close to the children and said, suddenly and softly, Trust me. I wish we could, said Anthea. You feel, said the Egyptian, that I want your amulet. That makes you distrust me. Yes, said Cyril bluntly. But you also, you want my amulet, and I am trusting you. There's something in that, said Robert. We have the two halves of the amulet, said the priest, but not yet the pin that joined them. Our only chance of getting that is to remain together. Once part these two halves, and they may never be found in the same time and place. Be wise. Our interests are the same. Before anyone could say more, the skipper came back, and with him the dye-master. His hair and beard were curled like the men's in Babylon, and he was dressed like the skipper, but with added grandeur of gold and embroidery. He had necklaces of beads and silver, and a glass amulet, with a man's face very like his own, set between two bull's heads, as well as gold and silver bracelets and armlets. He looked keenly at the children, then he said, my brother Felis has just come back from Tarshish. He's at his garden house, unless he's hunting wild boar in the marshes. He gets frightfully bored on shore. Arr, said the skipper. He's a true born Phoenician. Tire, tire forever, or oh, tire rules the waves, as the old song says. I'll go at once and show him my young barbarians. I should, said the dye master. They are very rum, aren't they? What frightful clothes, and what a lot of them. Observe the covering of their feet. Hideous indeed. Robert could not help thinking how easy, and at the same time pleasant, it would be to catch hold of the dye master's feet and tip him backward into the great sunken vat just near him. But if he had, flight would have had to be the next move, so he restrained his impulse. There was something about this Tyrian adventure that was different from all the others. It was somehow calmer 
and there was the undoubted fact that the charm was there on the neck of the egyptian so they enjoyed everything to the full the row from the island city to the shore the ride on the donkeys that the skipper hired at the gate of the mainland city and the pleasant country palms and figs and cedars all about it was like a garden clematis honeysuckle and jasmine clung about the olive and mulberry trees and there were tulips and gladiolus and clumps of mandrake which has bell flowers that look as though they were cut out of dark blue jewels in the distance were the mountains of lebanon the house they came to at last was rather like a bungalow long and low with pillars all along the front cedars and sycamores grew near it and sheltered it pleasantly everyone dismounted and the donkeys were led away why is this like rosherville whispered robert and instantly supplied the answer because it's the place to spend a happy day it's jolly decent of the skipper to have brought us to such a ripping place said cyril do you know said anthea this feels more real than anything else we've seen it's like a holiday in the country at home the children were left alone in a large hall the floor was mosaic done with wonderful pictures of ships and sea beasts and fishes through an open doorway they could see a pleasant courtyard with flowers i should like to spend a week here said jane and donkey ride every day everyone was feeling very jolly even the egyptian looked pleasanter than usual and then quite suddenly the skipper came back with a joyous smile with him came the master of the house he looked steadily at the children and nodded twice yes he said my steward will pay you the price but i shall not pay at that high rate for the egyptian dog the two passed on this said the egyptian is a pretty kettle of fish what, what is asked all the children at once our present position said rechmara our seafaring friend he added has sold us all for slaves a hasty council succeeded the shock of this announcement the priest was allowed to take part in it his advice was stay because they were in no danger and the amulet in its completeness must be somewhere near or of course they could not have come to that place at all and after some discussion they agreed to this the children were treated more as guests than as slaves but the egyptian was sent to the kitchen and made to work Phyllis, the master of the house went off that very evening by the king's orders to start on another voyage and when he was gone his wife found the children amusing company and kept them talking and singing and dancing till quite late do distract my mind for my sorrows she said i do like being a slave remarked jane cheerfully as they curled up on the big soft cushions that were to be their beds it was black night when they were awakened each by a hand passed softly over its face and a low voice that whispered be quiet or all is lost so they were quiet it's me Rech Mara, the priest of a man said the whisperer the man who brought us has gone to sea again and he has taken my amulet from me by force and i know no magic to get it back is there magic for that in the amulet you bear everyone was instantly awake by now we can go after him said cyril leaping up but he might take ours as well or he might be angry with us for following him i'll see to that said the egyptian in the dark hide your amulet well there in the deep blackness of that room in the tyrian country house the amulet was once more held up and the word spoken all passed through on to a ship that tossed and tumbled on a wind-blown sea they crouched together there till morning and jane and cyril were not at all well when the dawn showed dove-coloured across the steely waves they stood up 
as well as they could for the tumbling of the ship Phyllis, that hardy sailor and adventurer turned quite pale when he turned round suddenly and saw them well he said well i never did master said the egyptian bowing low and that was even more difficult than standing up we are here by the magic of the sacred amulet that hangs round your neck i never did repeated Phyllis. well well what port is the ship bound for asked robert with a nautical air but Phyllis said are you a navigator robert had to own that he was not then said Phyllis, i don't mind telling you that we're bound for the tin isles tyre alone knows where the tin isles are it is a splendid secret we keep from all the world it is as great a thing to us as your magic to you he spoke in quite a new voice and seemed to respect both the children and the amulet a good deal more than he had done before the king sent you didn't he said jane yes answered Phyllis. he bade me set sail with half a score of brave gentlemen and this crew you shall go with us and see many wonders he bowed and left them what are we going to do now said robert when Phyllis had caused them to be left along with a breakfast of dried fruits and a sort of hard biscuit wait till he lands in the tin isles said rechmara then we can get the barbarians to help us we will attack him by night and tear the sacred amulet from his accursed heathen neck he added grinding his teeth when shall we get to the tin isles asked jane oh six months perhaps or a year said the egyptian cheerfully a year of this cried jane and cyril who was still feeling far too unwell to care about breakfast hugged himself miserably and shuddered it was robert who said look here we can shorten that year jane out with the amulet wish that we were where the amulet will be when the ship is twenty miles from the tin island that'll give us time to mature our plans it was done the work of a moment and there they were on the same ship between grey northern sky and grey northern sea the sun was setting in a pale yellow line it was the same ship but it was changed and so were the crew weather-worn and dirty were the sailors and their clothes torn and ragged and the children saw that of course though they had skipped the nine months the ship had had to live through them Phyllis looked thinner and his face was rugged and anxious ha he cried the charm has brought you back i have prayed to it daily these nine months and now you are here have you no magic that can help what is your need asked the egyptian quietly i need a great wave that shall whelm away the foreign ship that follows us a month ago it lay in wait for us by the pillars of the gods and it follows follows to find out the secret of tyre the place of the tin islands if i could steer by night i could escape them yet but to-night there will be no stars my magic will not serve you here said the egyptian but robert said my magic will not bring up great waves but i can show you how to steer without stars he took out the shilling compass still fortunately in working order that he had bought off another boy at school for fivepence a piece of india rubber a strip of whalebone and half a stick of red sealing wax and he showed Phyllis how it worked and Phyllis wondered at the compass's magic truth i will give it to you robert said in return for that charm about your neck Phyllis made no answer he first laughed snatched the compass from robert's hand and turned away still laughing be comforted the priest whispered our time will come the dusk deepened and Phyllis crouched beside a dim lantern steered by the shilling compass from the crystal palace 
no one ever knew how the other ship sailed but suddenly in the deep night the lookout man at the stern cried out in a terrible voice she's close upon us and we said Felez, are close to the harbour he was silent a moment then suddenly he altered the ship's course and then he stood up and spoke good friends and gentlemen he said who are bound with me in this brave venture by our king's command the false foreign ship is close on our heels if we land they land and only the gods know whether they might not beat us in a fight and themselves survive to carry back the tale of tired secret island to enrich their own miserable land shall this be never cried the half dozen men near him the slaves were rowing hard below and could not hear his words the egyptian leapt upon him suddenly fiercely as a wild beast leaps give me back my amulet he cried and caught at the charm the chain that held it snapped and it lay in the priest's hand Felez laughed standing balanced to the leap of the ship that answered the oar-stroke this is no time for charms and mummeries he said we've lived like men and will die like gentlemen for the honor and glory of tyre our splendid city tyre tyre forever it's tyre that rules the waves i steer her straight for the dragon rocks and we go down for our city as brave men should the creeping cowards who follow shall go down as slaves and slaves they shall be to us when we live again tyre tyre forever a great shout went up and the slaves below joined in it quick the amulet cried anthea and held it up Rechmara held up the one he had snatched from Felez. The word was spoken, and the two great arches grew on the plunging ship in the shrieking wind under the dark sky. From each amulet a great and beautiful green light streamed, and shone far out over the waves. It illuminated, too, the black faces and jagged teeth of the great rocks that lay not two ships' lengths from the boat's peaked nose. Tire! Tire forever! It's Tyre that rules the waves. The voices of the doomed rose in a triumphant shout. The children scrambled through the arch and stood trembling and blinking in the Fitzroy Street parlour, and in their ears still sounded the whistle of the wind and the rattle of the oars, the crash of the ship's bow on the rocks, and the last shout of the brave gentlemen adventurers who went to their deaths singing for the sake of the city they loved. And so we've lost the other half of the amulet again, said Anthea, when they had told the Samiad all about it. Nonsense, pooh, said the Samiad. That wasn't the other half. It was the same half that you've got, the one that wasn't crushed and lost. But how could it be the same? said Anthea gently. Well, not exactly, of course. The one you've got is a good many years older. But at any rate, it's not the other one. What did you say when you wished? I forget, said Jane. I don't, said the Samiad. You said, take us where you are. And it did. So you see, it was the same half. I see, said Anthea. But you mark my words, the Samiad went on. You'll have trouble with that priest yet. Why, he was quite friendly, said Anthea. All the same, you'd better beware of the Reverend Rekmara. Oh, I'm sick of the amulet, said Cyril. We shall never get it. Oh, yes, we shall, said Robert. Don't you remember December 3rd? Jinx, said Cyril. I'd forgotten that. I don't believe it, said Jane. And I don't feel at all well. If I were you, said the Samiad, I should not go out into the past again till that date. You'll find it safer not to go where you're likely to meet that Egyptian any more just at present. Of course we'll do as you say, said Anthea soothingly. Though there's something about his face that I really do like. Still, you don't want to run after him, I suppose snapped the samiad you wait till the third 
and then see what happens cyril and jane were feeling far from well anthea was always obliging so robert was overruled and they promised and none of them not even the samiad at all foresaw as you no doubt do quite plainly exactly what it was that would happen on that memorable date End of chapter 13